Thank you. Yes, I'm a China academic. I have a PhD in linguistics from the University of Michigan, which makes me perfect moderator for this panel. <laughs> um, so uh, let's just jump in because we only have 45 minutes and we want to give some question and answer session from time. And one hour, one hour, and then question and answer? Yes. Like oh, okay. That's much better. Okay. <laughs> About an hour and a half. No, no bargaining, I guess. <laughs> we'll try it. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, I wanted to start. I will delve into each of the authors a little bit and let them talk about their book as much as they want to talk about. And there's a lot of areas that you can go into. We have everything from the his historical sex to up-to-date sex right now happening in the streets. <laughs> uh, but I wanted to just to start out with, it's, given the context, I think we should have a, a conversation about uh, Chinese and Western uh, sexual culture, sex culture, and so on. Uh, with apologies for the word Western, because I know some, uh, some people bridle or bristle at that word, the West, what does that mean exactly? Um, but but our, our historian expert here said it's okay to use West, so we use it as, as, a, as a shorthand, convenient term. Um, but we can include India and other cultures in this too. So that, what I want to just start out with is, all of you know clearly a lot about the subject, and some of you have been in China a long time. Is it even meaningful to talk about sex as a, a sort of a universal human feature of all cultures that in Chinese we would say da tong xiao yi, six of one half dozen of the other, it's the same kind of thing. Or, or are there really significant differences in the, the sexual culture of China that are interesting to talk about? In other words, do they have China, Chinese sex with, chi sex with Chinese characteristics? <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting topic, and I'll just let you three throw that idea around the world. Okay, so um, David, I think people do have sex all around the world, <laughs> <laughs> so it's legitimate to, to look at it and talk about it and write about it. And, um, but I, I think my own work is about the first sexual revolution in the West, which happened in the 18th century. It's about uh, a tremendous transformation in Western ideas towards sex. So, so the first point is that you know, cultures change tremendously just within the culture. Um, for most of Western history, sex outside marriage was illegal, prohibited, people were punished for it. Um, thousands of people every year went to court, were banished from their homes, were executed sometimes even. And then in the 18th century, there's this huge revolution which brings about what we think of now as you know, our values, modern Western values, that we now take completely for granted, sexual freedom, the freedom to do what you like with your own body. That hasn't existed for most of Western history. And I think similarly, if you look at Chinese history, which I've started to do a little bit, because I'm fascinated by this um, cross-cultural question, um, there are very big differences between how the West has proceeded historically and, and where it is now, and, and, and where China is, and where it's been. But now, you know, my, my colleagues... Well, uh, Zhang Lijia grew, come, came of age in the 1980s, when uh, I think your, your line is that uh, after Mao died, Chinese women began to grow breasts. Yeah, I know all of your good lines. I'm gonna start all of them. We have to come up with new ones. But anyway, to talk about about the because the eighties was when so the influx of foreign, you know, as Dum Xiaoping said, some flies got in the window during that period. Maybe we could talk about that a little bit. Sure, I, I, David quoted actually, it's, uh, it's not my line, it's uh, a famous American journalist and famously joked that, uh, um, that after Deng Xiaoping introduced um, economic reforms, the Chinese women suddenly got breasts. Because before that, you know, um, as you, people here, you all know, during the culture of Mao time, you know, everybody was wearing Mao's lumpy jacket, you know. Um, and uh, of course, uh, the, you know, with no dresses, no makeup. So the 80s was a time that the Chinese women started gingerly unbuttoning Chairman Mao's straight jacket and put on <laughs> makeup, you know, and, and you know, maybe grow breasts, maybe show breasts, start to show breasts. There <laughs> was no, no push up bras at that time yet, um, but starting wearing make makeup, sh um, short skirts, and um, and uh, you know, I think just um, um, began to um, have um, become more sexually 
active because before that it was, a, you know, this uh, asexual culture dominated the China. Some have to Mao maybe thought that if people show too much, you know, interest in um, in sex, then they will reduce their revolutionary passion. Um, Did it reduce his revolutionary passion? <laughs> <laughs> That's a separate panel. <laughs> So anyway, of course, and then China gingerly opened the door. Now, for example, I mean, in the middle of the 80s, there was still discussion was a, um, a, a one couple, uh, one man wrote a paper in the newspaper, so disgusted to see a young couple kissing in a bus. Because, the, you know, kissing for a long time, that's something only we saw in the foreign films. And in fact, Chinese people don't, didn't read it, that didn't show public affection. Um, and, um, and, and we're talking about Yin He and, uh, this famous uh, sex expert, um, she did a survey in 1989. <clears throat> the result was that um, 15% of people admitted to have had premarital sex. And among those 15% of people, half of them, <clears throat> they were actually legally married, they got a certificate. They were already committed themselves, but didn't have the wedding yet because they needed money and all that. And, and a recent survey shows that uh, more than 70% of people, um, you know, admitted they, they have had a um, um, premarital sex. And, um, you know, the, um, the other indicators of the sexual revolution, you know, have started in China. Um, to start with, I think it's uh, safer now to be naughty. Um, I remember in the, in the, in the 80s, while uh, I became a factory worker in 1980, um, a few months later, one of my colleagues was sent to uh, sent to labor camp because he was caught um, having an extramarital affair with uh, a young married unmarried woman. Um, but now, you know, you can imagine that you know people uh, extramarital sex become very common, and uh, people have more sexual more sexual partners, and uh, people more far more adventurous in, in the bedroom. Um, according to various survey. So yes, I think I, would, I think I, you can say that. Yeah, maybe even if, if anything, the, the what we hear and from Jemima's book, China might be even a little bit more adventuresome and wild than what we think of as the U.S. to these days, which seems a little more prudish to me. Remember, uh, Princeton scholar, formerly Princeton scholar Perry Link, once said that uh, a friend of his, you know, back in in the eighties during in your day there. People didn't have access to their own room or they didn't yes. have space yes. to even have sex. And, and he said that one intellectual said to him, until we saw American porno movies, we didn't even know you could make noise during sex. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a big revelation. But that, yes, Jemima, you, your book is all about the rally new <laughs> sexual culture in China. What do you think? Uh, you know, is, it, is, it, is it fully open now or is there still some differences? The big, the big question. Well, I would say there's, you know, there's a combination. My book is a lot about my own, I spent a lot of time thinking, living in China, thinking what would my life be like if I had been born Chinese and had been born in a similar background, you know, well-educated, middle, kind of emerging middle class, um, urban dweller. And I think the interesting bit was always looking at the sex, going back to the original thing in terms of, can you speak about a universal sex culture or are there unique sex cultures I think there's an overlap, and I talk a lot about where there are the commonalities and where there are the differences, whether Chinese people are more daring than people in the US, in some respects, yes, and I often, when I'm citing a statistic such as this amount of people are homophobic in China, I often say, you know, before you get angry with Chinese people and say this is really terrible, don't think that this doesn't happen back home. So I'm very keen to kind of point out where there is the overlap, at the same time where there are the differences. The other thing which goes to what Yudara is saying is that it's not just about sexual cultures across nationalities, but also across generations. And one of the biggest themes was that Chinese kids of my age just don't have a huge amount in common with their parents. There are some commonalities. There is still an intense pressure to marry, but there's also a huge gap. And I think for lots of young people coming of age now, that's quite confusing. Not that you sit at home exchanging sex tips with your parents. There is a level of 
you know, my parents still had lots of different partners before they got married. There's an understanding there, an empathy there, which isn't entirely shared between the children now. I have a question back to historical issues. It seems to me, you know, we were talking a little bit in a podcast we did about it. The, the, the sort of forces of sexual repression in the two different cultures. It seems to me like I have not read your book yet, and I, uh, Ferris, this is his book. Is the camera on this book? It's also yeah. Chinese. It's also <laughs> Chinese <laughs> there. Wow. Okay. But I, I didn't kindle it because I think the pictures might be really worth seeing. So I decided <laughs> I got the actual book. But uh, I think the, the role of religion in the West has had a huge impact on you know, the sexual life. Uh, I, I, my favorite quote uh, that's related to this is Voltaire, uh, when he, Vol Voltaire, the philosopher, when he first tasted ice cream, he said, but this is delicious. What a pity it isn't forbidden. <laughs> which, which, you know, I always think religion adds a little yeah. bit of that spice to sex. Now the question is, in China, does Confucianism play any similar role as, as the you know, the pushback, the thing that makes sex dirty. I think, yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and therefore fun, right? <laughs> I, think there are, I think there are two things that repress sexual freedom in cultures everywhere, uh, potentially anyway. The first, which is pretty universal, is a kind of patriarchal mindset that, first of all, uh, men rule and they rule over women, they own women. This is a you know, common feature of many cultures, that the, the idea that a woman can't do what she likes with her own body is because of it doesn't belong to her, it belongs to her father and then it belongs to her husband. And, th and this view uh, is equally prevalent in China throughout its history. And you, know, you can find this everywhere. This is not something that's about uh, China particularly. Um, but the other thing that, that on top of that that you find, if I, and, and by the way, it's not just um, men over women, it's the community over the individual. That's the idea. It's the family over the individual, it's the community over the individual. So women often play a very important Part in upholding these um, uh, forms of regulation. The other is. I.e., foot binding. Foot binding. It was continued yes. by the women more than the men. Absolutely. And, and, and a fetish, you know, amazing fetish in, in Chinese past for the chastity of widows and, you know, putting up monuments to uh, women who resisted remarriage after widowhood and so on. Um, the second thing is religion. Now, here I think the West has uh, a dubious. Uh, claim to fame. I think Christianity <laughs> probably is the most uh, <laughs> uh, repressive. Uh, Christianity is a, is, a, is a major religion most obsessed with sex and most opposed to it and most of the view that it is ultimately dirty and polluting and dangerous and that, you know, carnal... Isn't it? <laughs> we'll have this conversation later, don't we? <laughs> um, and, and so um, the idea that it should be ultimately you know, the Catholic Church takes, takes us to the extreme, of course. The Catholic Church and most of Western history is the there is no other. Um, that, that, that chastity, uh, sorry, that, that um, I think, yeah, but you, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, uh, to, to not have sex at all. Celibacy is the ultimate, is the only completely pure way of, of behaving. Um, and I think Confucianism is much less of the view that sex itself is bad. In fact, in, as I understand it, the Chinese have the opposite view that, that sex traditionally. Sex is a good thing, is a natural thing, everyone should have sex, but... Taoism. Yes, and Taoists are, uh, are very strong on you know, mysticism and communing uh, sexually, but still though, it's always within marriage, I think, essentially. And, and the other thing is, it's very sexist. And the, the, um, the idea that, that, that I find so striking, overriding everything else in, in um, Chinese writing about sex, is that a woman, by achieving orgasm, can give the man vital life juices. And so all these medieval manuals that exist and that earlier sexologists thought showed the freeness of sexual culture because you do as much as you can to produce pleasure in the woman. It's not about the woman's pleasure. It's about making her come so that you can suck her life juices from her and then cast her aside. And I, I suspect Chairman Mao's appetites have something to do, okay, based on this, uh, I don't know if everyone knows about these, but they're, they're well documented, uh, based on something of this ancient atavistic Chinese idea that you... What you say is not in Confucius, so <laughs> I've read Confucius and he doesn't mention it's that. It's not in Confucius, <laughs> but there are many other strands in Chinese culture. Go ahead. Uh, Li Jia, your book, 
uh, is about prostitution. And speaking of, it, it seems to segue pretty well with what Farah was saying about exploitation of women. Uh, first of all, why, why did you, it, it's, the book is fiction. Yes, I have to say it's a pure work of fiction, not based uh, on, not a memoir based on personal experience. <laughs> but you did do a lot of research, I know, on it. You talked to some prostitutes and you went there. But, uh, yes, I, I interviewed many prostitutes and uh, made friends with them, and I worked for NGO and in Tianjin, uh, run by a former prostitute, and this NGO is dedicated to. Uh, helping a, a, a female sex workers, mostly very low grade uh, sex workers, and I just you know went around and distributing condoms, just just talking to them it was uh, any fascinating. Anyway, I, um, I I found writing the book was very very difficult and partly because you know the uh, the book is called Lotus. It's um, a book about prostitution. The two leading characters, one is a prostitute. Originally from um, from Sichuan, and she comes to the city. To, you know, she dreams to better have a better life in the city. Works in the um, factory and things has gone. <coughs> and many um, prostitutes in working working girls in China. Um, m vast majority of them are the migrant workers. You know, they're from the village, uh, ill-educated, unskillful, and ill-prepared and, um, for the city life. And I spent some time in Shenzhen and Dongguan. Many of the working girls there, they're actually former uh, factory workers. And then one of their factory workers, um, for whatever reason, become a, a working girl. And her colleagues, her friends, and they say, oh, "Why? You know, she she didn't have to go. She, she didn't have to go to work, and from nine to you know ten, and then she you know she enjoys much more free time." With her and she had a better life and the others said, oh, it's easy, why, why do I do that? Anyway, there's such a woman there, they have very limited career options and um, getting to prostitution is probably you know, one of the easy ways to um, get money. Anyway, so yes, this is book of, so I spent lots of time um, talking to them, understanding them. It's just a really fascinating. Um, I, think of, I think of just people, both men and women, often have fantasy about, um, about uh, Prostitutes like so I so many I can't remember how many people ask me this question. Are the prostitutes beautiful? <laughs> and they are just normal women. Um, some beautiful, some not, not so beautiful. Um, <clears throat> and they um, and, and also I think that just that people have this idea they I mean they do suffer. Um, for example, one of the biggest challenges they face is um, um, uh, violence. Not so much violence from Violence from police, uh, from clients, but more importantly, more threateningly from uh, from the police. Police often rape them, and we have this uh, horrible system called um, uh, law, law jiao, um, custody education. Once you get caught, you are sent to this place, and you have to lay, work there, um, forced into forced labor. And worse for the family, uh, discover. But are they, are they, they, yeah, of course. Exactly like. 17th and 16th century Europe. Interesting really? Yeah. Um, no, I mean, <laughs> But it's also very interesting that, you know, they, 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 yeah, the life of this, the life, I wouldn't describe the, you know, a, bit, a rose, a bed of rose, but um, uh, it's, uh, they also more layered, for example, they do enjoy the, many of the, all the working girls I know, they send money to their home. So the, the, that increased their standing within the family, and um, they have increased their position within the family, and um, they, um, they, enjoy the, they enjoy the power, they have the money brought them, and they enjoy the, um, the freedom as well, you know, living in, in, living in the city. And also, just some of the, the small details I find it so interesting. For example, some women do have experienced sexual pleasure, and some of them married and or divorced, they have never had that um, with, uh, with the husband. And some do fell in love, and one woman just said she, you know, the one client used to kind of call, describe her as beautiful, and she called her baby, and sweetheart, and then she just kind of really quite amazed, and she discovered things she never, she didn't get from her husband. But anyway, I was just trying to say the, you know, the, the life overall just quite, it's tough, but uh, also, but not just not, as you imagine, just, 
romantic, oh, yeah, yeah. right? No, it's more about a lot of people have said, you know, as you said, that the, the prostitution problem in China is more linked to questions like the hukou and migrancy than anything else. Present maybe in Europe, America, it's a class issue. These are women who don't have any other way of being living. Uh, I don't know. Right, Comparisons? Right. Well, I think historically, I mean, prostitution, we all think we know what it is, but if you think about it as the exchange of sex for uh, property, then actually it's very slippery. Similar to marriage. Similar to marriage, yeah, exactly. And, and, and so in, in the Western past, uh, when prostitution was a much more central aspect of uh, culture, people grappled quite seriously with the question of whether there is actually any difference between you know, a working girl, as you talk about it, and a high-class courtesan, but really there isn't in terms of what they're doing. It's just in different um, parts of society. I think that the key uh, difference often in terms of different sexual cultures is um, living in the city and living in especially large cities. I mean, in the West, this is part of what creates the first sexual revolution, the first explosion of sexual freedom in practice and people actually arguing for the idea, I mean, the ideal of, of sexual privacy. Um, because most of Western history, people live in tiny villages across the European countryside, you know, maybe a few hundred people. It's very easy in places like that for the church and the state to um, uh, regulate people, what people think, how they behave, what their religion is, uh, and, and their sexual uh, conduct as well. But the moment they start to, to live in big cities, and London is the place I focus on most, it's a, you know, the greatest city in the world in the 17th and 18th centuries, the biggest city in the world by 1800. You know, when there are more than a million people living together, that creates a completely different environment and new ways of, of um, living, new ways of men and women meeting each other and communicating, and new forms of media, which are tremendously important. Media explosion in the 18th century as well. And I think um, that creates, well, that creates new forms of prostitution, but that's just a tiny aspect of what it creates in terms of sexual freedom and opportunities. And what's so interesting to me, not just as a historian, but as a scholar of, of sexuality going around the world, talking about the West, is you, know, you see exactly these things happening now in lots of places outside the West. Um, in India, in China, uh, everywhere where you have major modern, quote unquote, Western cities, um, there, these uh, explosions of, of sexuality are happening, sexual revolutions are happening, but against a backdrop where often you still have, um, you know, perhaps a majority of the population living in the countryside, and a, a, a continuation of old-fashioned patriarchal attitudes about the family and about marriage and about the difference between men and women. Um, and I think, uh, certainly in India, and I think also in, in China, there's a huge difference between rural sexuality still and urban yes, sexuality. Yes. Can I just work on one, one, one point before I pass on this to you? Um, the, what are the, why is sexual revolution now, it's happening now in China? We have a, a phrase called Wenba er zhi ying yu, means uh, once your, your tummy is full, once you are warm, you start thinking about sex. It had a lot to do with uh, China's fast economic development. And, you know, um, you know <laughs> people now, um, uh, also for so long, China, Chinese people feel they've been deprived of fun. And suddenly there's, you know, there's, uh, there's uh, money, there's, you know, growing wealth, and relaxed the control in the society. I mean, still, you know, uh, you know, there's still a common state, but um, uh, the relaxed control, so people now certainly enjoy a lot more personal freedom. So with the, you know, growing wealth, relaxed social control, and I think there's a kind of a spur, this um, hedonistic tendency. People want to have, have fun, you know, do well, sex is a big part of it. I'm sure, you know, you know a lot more about this. <laughs> well, it, the, the subject of my book was not, I didn't actually look at prostitution per se, but I think, as we're saying, you know, it kind of, the, the values of exchanging money for sex does permeate all of society and I think especially in China today where as I'm sure everyone here is aware of the ridiculous cliche that a woman wants a house and a car from the man that they marry. Um, what I mean I actually take quite a lot of offence to that statement. I don't think it's true. I think some women do look at that. I think others don't. I think interestingly in terms of marriage actually it's one of the areas where if you're aware of the 
again, the Shungnu, the leftover woman, and you've read Letter Hong Finch's book, where lots of women are actually being completely screwed out of the monetary aspect of marriage. So whilst they're in the marriage, yeah, maybe if they marry someone rich, they can access their bank account, but the, it's not theirs, it's not in their name, there's no longevity, whereas the mistress culture, they maybe actually have a little bit more bargaining power, and then the mistress <laughs> is probably the kind of the next step, the, the wedge in between, I guess, a wife and a prostitute. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's an interesting topic in, in, in and of itself. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, China has the tradition of concubinage. Mm -hmm. Was your grandmother a concubine as well as a prostitute? Um, yes, my, uh, the reason I'm so interested in, in prostitution was because my grandmother uh, was uh, served as a working girl. And then she, she met uh, my grandfather on the job. In 1949, after the communists took over power, men were ordered to have one wife, and he decided to stay with my grandmother, his concubine, uh, instead of his wife. I mean, in the olden days, uh, the way to show uh, for men to show his power, prestige, and wealth was to have concubine, and the more, more the better. And, and as it is now, we've come back to that. Uh, that's what I'm, that's the point I'm making. And uh, you have a chapter in your article, or no, it's so something else you're writing about setbacks. Uh, but concubinage uh, in the West too, right? But but in China it seems like it's it's been endemic, and it was the Mao period was like an anomaly where they didn't allow it anymore. Now we're back, uh, you know, in in spades. So the more money you have, the more mistresses, the more arnai and senai and sunai that you have. And virtually every leader from Wuxilai on down has had hundreds of, of these. So what is this? If this is a difference in the cultures now, right? It, you you may have that in the U.S. But it's not an open thing. That, that it's not an open. I think um, one of the uh, one of the interesting things about that is that it has to do with Chinese, Chinese differences in terms of attitudes to polygamy and having more wives and so on. Now there is a Western tradition of that, but it's it's not a very prominent tradition. In the 18th century, when people started to talk about sexual freedom, they suddenly got very interested again in, in polygamy because it's a it's a way for men to have sexual freedom without women having it. Um, because you, 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 the idea is if you seduce a woman, they just marry her and, and then you have lots of wives. Um, I think the interesting thing about China is, is why this idea is uh, so much more prevalent here has also to do, I think, with the, um, the imbalance between men and women in the society, which, as I understand it, unbalanced Now, that's not just a product of the, of the one parent policy, although that's aggravated at times. What, what, sorry, what, what child? <laughs> Some sex education. Not just the one child. Yeah, if you go back to 16th, 15th, 14th medieval China, there are there is an imbalance in the sex ratio. Even then, people preferred having boys to having girls, with horrible consequences for the numbers of women in society. And so, um, you know, women are highly prized. Uh, status symbol. By the way, I, I, we're talking about Arne. I, I regard Arne still as a prostitute because the union, uh, of such union, the base of such union is not emotional needs but money. Well, yeah, to an extent, but I think with the Arne, there is an element of choice. I, I mean, I haven't, as I said, spoken to prostitutes, but I would assume that when someone comes to the brothel and says, I want to have sex with you, you can't say yes or no, that you usually, there's that's what happens. Whereas with the R night, you know, some of them, some of them actually meet the men, you know, within a context of just a legitimate relationship, and then they find out later that they've actually got a partner, by which stage they're already emotionally involved. Other people obviously specifically go out to find married men, but I don't think it's just, it's not always completely straightforward, at least at the start, as to why they're getting together. There's there's little stigma in this society, it seems to me. Am I wrong? I mean, even among even yes, Arne, yes, the, Arne and I get together, and we're just Arne and we shop yes, together. It's against, no big deal. But interestingly, against Arne, not so much against the men. In fact, I met on my well, not close friends, but I know met uh, male friends um, who uh, boast about having keeping mistress. Yes. Is, is this is this any difference in France when you had was it Mitterrand or who would have had? Went to a funeral with his wife on one hand, his mistress on the other. Just the open. Is that different? Is that the same? What's going on? Frogs is always very different. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one of the things I think is really mesmerizing for me about the R and the kind of the prostitution, the sex culture in China is that it's 
the lots of the women, the wives actually know about it too, and they can sometimes, even if they, some of them don't really like it, but they don't necessarily say anything, some of them actually openly say, okay, you know what, I get it, if you want to do well in business, this is just the game you've got to play, you've got to, to climb up the corporate ladder, you've got to have other women, and they kind of allow it to happen, which is, from my, you know, I think this is a key difference between they, you know, men cheat the world over. This is something that happens. And also, I'd add that women cheat too. But you know, men cheat the world over. But in the UK, it's not really celebrated. It's it's quite hidden. Whereas in China, it's it's the biggest open secret. Uh, but that is, a, I mean, that is a historical development that has to do with the empowerment of women in Western society. Actually, you know, comparatively recently, in the, if you go back to the 18th century, uh, courtesans are tremendously famous, and men, including men who are married often want to be seen with a courtesan, have one as a trophy and so on. And, and um, you know, if you go back through history, that becomes even more strongly the case, that, you know, for men, having sex with another woman is a, is a kind of mark of power and status, even if it's, if it's prohibited. But I think the other thing here is that we should, we, should, we should be careful of thinking of marriage itself as kind of a fixed, unchanging uh, thing. And, and, and the idea that you put forward that each other was that you know marriage is for love and people emotionally get together and that's marriage and everything else is prostitution but you know that definition of marriage is is a culturally changeable one and, and actually in many respects a new one doesn't apply the world over even today uh, for most of Western history people do get married primarily for love that was you know that, that idea was actually a taboo idea it was, it was thought to be irrational if you mainly married for emotion that would never last that would never work you know, there are many cultures where people still take the view. Well, the, there are many reasons why the prostitution now has, you know, made a spectacular return. You know, after 1949, Mao really exactly, you know, closed up all the, the brothels who were educated um, and the working girls who were assigned jobs. Um, even now, in recent years, um, they've had a, made a spectacular return. And there are, you know, lots of reasons. So one of the reasons is that uh, it has become such uh, a normal part of the business practice. Um, I had uh, a, a friend, uh, um, a professor, who does business on the side, and uh, his com company is a high tech company, which is entitled to 50% of uh, a tax reduction. Um, deduction. But uh, he would have to kind of a dining, dining officials. Now you know that's how you get you know, get things done. But uh, now nowadays you know have. Get, Taking them to fancy restaurants is not enough, but often they want to have girls. There are plenty of such establishments, you know, by the sea, on the sea front, fancy place, you have dining and you go to the party, party rooms. Wow, I'm in the wrong profession. <laughs> 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 let's let's switch topics a little bit, it's okay? Um, I wanted to because we're getting running out of time. I want to get into the uh, LGBT. You know, one interesting thing is China it seems to be historically has not had oh. maybe because it has had the religious injunction against homosexuality. Mm -hmm. The Burrs were famously gay, and um, and I was also wondering about this issue of differences in the way it's perceived. On on, on this podcast we did the other day, we pointed out that in the U.S., if a son comes out to his mom as gay then the mother will say, oh no, my son's going to go to hell. <laughs> but in China, if, if the son comes out to his mom as gay, the mom says, oh no, my, I'm not going to have any grandchildren. It's very confusion as opposed to sin, you know. Um, but there's a lot to talk about, and maybe Li Yinhe, we can mention her, but who wants to jump in about, maybe, uh, Jemima has, has, has a lot in her book about that, I'm sure, right? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah I interviewed a lot of, um, a lot of gay men as well as a lesbian. I didn't actually interview anyone who was trans, but I spoke about that quite a lot. Um, one of the most surprising bits that I found was that no one was, most of the men, there was one person who was very, very liberal, had gone to, I think he'd gone to Baydar and decided that it wasn't liberal enough for him, even though it was the big liberal university, and had then gone to Stanford. So he was, you know, he's not remotely by any measurement your typical Chinese. The other men that I interviewed, I think, were more typical, and they just, could not come out to their parents. They often couldn't come out to their bosses, even though you know they were completely integrated in the Beijing um, LGBT scene. And one of the things that came out of that was that you know the the importance of the family, and also that it's so much of it is about kind of a performance that you that you can't disrupt harmony. That there's this view that you all have to 
get married for whatever reason, have kids, and there's not a huge amount of wiggle room within that. Now, as David said, it's not necessarily coming from centuries and centuries of religious homophobia, though in the 19th century, lots of religious texts from the West were translated into China, and Christianity is obviously growing here, so you, it's not completely devoid of that either, but for the most part, it is just this, this kind of core, Confucian core, that doesn't, is stubbornly remaining. I think, I, I, yeah, I, I think that's entirely true as far as I can see. But it does come from centuries and centuries of, you know, doctrine. And, and whether you think of Confucianism as a religion or not is slightly beside the point. It, this idea of harmony and marriage and, and family as the center and the be-all and end-all of sexual practice is so strong in Chinese culture, it kind of takes the place of Christian repression or, you know. And, and, and it's also not, it is also the case that for hundreds of years, uh, homosexual practices are banned, are illegal in China. First of all, under the king, is that, do I pronounce that properly? The, the king? The king. Yeah. That's an English word. No, no, quick, quick, Qing, Qing, sorry. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Qing, 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 I'm sorry. I should, I should have Googled translated this. That Qing, the Qing dynasty makes solemn, solemn practices, same-sex practices between men illegal. Now, why do they do that? Um, they don't do that because, uh, of homophobia per se in a kind of Western sense. They do that because these are non-procreative practices and they make the same, uh, they have the same attitude to all sex outside marriage that's not going to produce children within a family. Um, so it is illegal. And, and now, of course, everyone knows that this doesn't apply to the upper classes. Uh, it's about the population and creating a strong peasant population. But still, you know, it does apply to them and the, the the fact that they do this ideologically is very significant. And I think the continuity there into the 20th century is that um, you know, the Communist Party also takes a quite similar view about sex outside marriage. And indeed, as I understand it, homosexuality was illegal in China until fairly recently. So there is a continuity there. And it is homophobic, but in a different sense and for different so reasons. China was often I'm talking about recent years, I'm talking about uh, being mental mental illness. Yes. They have yeah. various yeah. ways. That's the only thing you're taking out is the, um, is, um, the men mental, yeah. um, classified as mental illness just recently. But it's not always the case. In, in, you know, for example, in, in China, a homosexualist called Ge Pao, uh, that's a story from, from the emperor and had a young lover. And the emperor wants to the, 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 the passions of the cut sleeve. Yes, so it's a fit. Disturbed the lover. The, so the, the emperor had this uh, boy lover, and rather than wake him up from, from his sleep. nap, he cut his sleep his robe rather than wake him up. So it's, it's a slang term, or it's a term for homosexuality. Go ahead. Yeah. But, uh, but only, yes, it's still, I mean, it's an ongoing process. I mean, among ordinary people, still, <coughs> just in case uh, something wrong with them. And if you read stories, only recently there was a story about uh, um, uh, uh, one place off a queue, um, electric shock. Um, anyway, that's. She's referring to, I guess, a recent lawsuit where there was a, uh, what do they call it, sex. Uh, CRP. Uh, sexual orientation. Second, what is it called? What is it called? Re Re reorientation. Reorientation. Re didn't, uh, didn't, uh, what's her name? Bachman, Michelle Bachman's husband was doing that or something. Convert, to convert you from homosexual, you know, to heterosexual. There was a case in the news recently where someone sued because uh, they had this fraudulent company that was doing that. I mean, this, this comes out of, if I can just top my book a little bit, the first sexual revolution in the West, because that's the point at which um, in the 18th century, people start to say, well, what the Bible says and what Christianity says and what governments say is not actually necessarily true. And in any case, the Bible is very complicated and we don't know, you know, everyone disagrees on its interpretation. What we should look to to understand what's right and wrong is primarily our conscience and our reason and what's natural. Look in nature and you'll see God's rules. And so from that point onwards, we in the West anyway, taken that to be our touch that if it's if it's natural it must be good and if it's good it must be uh, permissible and that leads to a tremendous explosion in thinking that uh, sex is good and, and right and pleasurable but of course it leads to increased focus on defining what is natural and so to begin with 
it's especially natural for men to have sex, not so much for women. And, and, uh, well, well, that, that, that leads to very interesting consequences. So that's part of the explosion of prostitution in the West in the 18th century and in the 19th century, where governments start to say, well, men, of course, need to have sex. It's natural for them. Their wives can't have it. What should we do? Um, and, uh, and so the regulation and the control and the, you know, the huge populations of prostitutes in Western cities are products of that. But, but, but it also leads to the growing sense that homosexuality is unnatural. And that's a new thing in the 18th century. And from that develops this increasingly powerful you know, public and social and governmental view that it's unnatural and dangerous, it's like a disease and we should try and expurgate it. And you know, even until the 1980s, governments in the West, in the United Kingdom, in the United States, had this as public policy. Well, you know, the laws that have been passed in Russia now are very similar to the laws that were passed in the United Kingdom in the 1980s under Mrs. Thatcher. So this idea is, is a very powerful part of modern Western ideals. But the other thing that you know, I talk about in my book, which is tremendously exciting, to have discovered is that the 18th century is also the point at which men and women who are in same-sex relationships and engage in same-sex activity start to argue and defend and think of their own practices as natural. So you get the first, you know, what we would think of as enunciations of gay rights and people saying, well, you know, this is just as natural for me to use my body in this way as it is for someone having sex uh, within marriage, and, and so the, the origins of, of gay rights also go back to the first sexual revolution. And I think we're, we're seeing that. I was talking about the you know, um, romanticization of a, a prostitute or courtesan, but in China, the, the courtesan did have a, a, a special place, because for for a long time, I mean, in China, you know, throughout the period of China, um, throughout the dynasties, and women, for most part, women were not allowed to socialize, to go out and socialize. So the only way for men to uh, to have elegant company and uh, to, um, to to even pursue love was to to see a prostitute, or to, to see high class courtesan who are trained in okay, practice calligraphy, play, sing and dance. Um, I know some of them become a very influential, becoming uh, you know, become getting to know very powerful people. I guess that's probably one of the reasons people have this romantic idea about prostitution. But the reality, of course, is um, it's especially I mean, today is very, very different. Let's bring it up to the present time here. Get into the Jolene Hall, maybe even uh, you know, because they're now the new ones having sex. So they. <laughs> I, you know, I have a strong impression, and I'd like to see what the three of you think. You know, living, whenever I go to the U.S., I get this impression, you know, like, sex is everywhere. It's up front. It's right there. There's Beyonce. It's right in front of your eyes. But, but, it, but it seems to be not particularly sexy, and people have hang-ups about sex, but yet sex is just permeates everything. But in China, you turn on CCTV, and there's no sex. And you watch the thing, you get no sex. But, but there's lots of sex, and it's really sexy sex. But, but not people are also a matter of fact about it. It's like, yeah, whatever, it's no big deal. I mean, uh, I remember even in 1999 or something, I was watching a Beijing TV show, and there was a sex expert, it was kind of like the Dr. Ruth, if you remember her, you know, of the time. And it was a call-in type show, and a man was calling in, and he said, yeah, I'm 55, and I find that, you know, I'm not perf performing very well, and I don't really know what to do about it. Is there a way, someone, some help I can get? And this woman said, 55? What? what are you worried about? You've had your time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, men just go on to something else. <laughs> and I thought this would never happen in the US. But it, it was sort of a refreshing, <laughs> realistic attitude. So, I can't just so what do you think? I'm just imagining um, the, um, you know, the STD. The, the group affected the most, a, gro a growing, the problem growing fastest, is um, um, among elderly men in China. Good for them. Is that because they're having sex outside? But that, that's because they're having sex with our knife, probably. <laughs> anyway, can you come? Maybe just talk, and, and maybe Jeremiah is going to focus. Can I just, just finish, is... finish this? I'm sorry. sorry. With old, old, older men. Well, that's quite interesting because uh, I think some of them, some of men probably they lost their wife, some of them lost wife, and some of them probably work away from home workers, migrant workers, and some of them they still have those. They're married. They just felt they have missed out the farm. 
and they also they are not so young people are probably more switched on you know how to put themselves so anyway so I think that's just really what and, and there's also way good now so yeah. Yeah, that's 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 I think probably I'll start with an anecdote in this respect I interviewed a man called Victor who He's about 26, 27 now, so I guess he's kind of, he must be on the cusp of Baling Ho, Joling Ho. Um, and he is trying to set up a sex toy company. Because, and to quote him off the top of my head, he says, you walk down the street in China and everyone appears really innocent, but actually, no, they're not. They're all really <laughs> kinky and they're going to buy my sex toys. <laughs> so, um, the sex toys are produced in China, is it probably? And you know? actually, he wants to import sex toys, interestingly, because he thinks all Chinese sex toys are going to explode because they're faulty. <laughs> and so that's, that was not his... explode on the market. You mean it's explode in people's bedrooms. So that's, that's Victor's um, niche and, you know, yeah, good luck to him like but I think that he is onto something there where there is the people are a lot more experimental in the bedroom and recently there have been quite a lot of surveys about a, a male erectile dysfunction in China being quite high and I think what's quite telling about this is that it's not necessarily that the problem's increasing it's just that because people are becoming more sexually experimental because they're becoming a lot more open about it you know people want to talk about these things they they want to really start to have experimental lives and i think it's a it's a really good thing in my opinion because lots of people i spoke to about the rampant mistress culture one of the things they said it it's a mixture of kind of you know the, the business policies that go on but there's also an extent to which the older generation were married not through love and and so they don't necessarily really want to rip off the clothes of their partners so so you know i think it's it's behind closed doors and i guess what will be interesting to see is whether that translates i mean at the moment or cctv are trying to get rid of um breasts but, but they also <laughs> so, but, but there's also a huge amount of ignorance i think there's a survey indicated some 60 percent of people don't know where the clit is uh, <laughs> don't try the u.s i'm not so sure <laughs> interest something but yeah I think the ignorance that is one of the, the things that's really troubling is they are becoming more aware but they're not necessarily becoming safer and that's why there's surging STIs. There's, there's, there's a sex shop on every street corner in Beijing. Yeah. What's up that all about Jemima? Tell me. How, that's not the case in, in England right? No, definitely no. not. In right. fact, so actually, why? they're trying to um, get rid of all the sex dolls in Soho in London, which everyone's quite annoyed about. <laughs> so it's the, the gentrification of London. Um, but what are all the sex dolls about? Well, actually, one of the things they sell, interestingly, little twisters, they sell hymen repair kits. So it's not, again, it's not all just about let's let's sell sex. It's also kind of sometimes can filter into going back to these traditional values of women in certain roles, men in certain roles. I mean, that's a lot of the sexual culture in China is about upholding you know, male power over women, I think. It, 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 you know, everything we've been saying about the mistress culture and you know, business, the, the presumption in all our talk about sex and business is business is what men do. There aren't any women there. And, and you know, I think one of the differences and what, why in the West you don't see so many sex shops and so on is partly to do with the internet and, and access to that and people buying things there, but why you don't see so much over prostitution is because there's a more sexually equal culture in which sex is something that women, as, as much as men, are able to value and, and take pleasure in and assert. You know, the, I'm often asked about Fifty Shades of Grey, um, <laughs> and, and, and my stock response is, I, I, I wish I'd read it, I just hadn't had time, but you know, it's, 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 a, it's a very exciting, oh, thank you, it's a very exciting thing to see lots and lots of young, well, women of all ages, sitting on public transport in buses, in trams, and trains uh, across the Western world, reading really badly written, horribly, <laughs> shocky, soft porn. It's, it, it's exciting because it's a sign of female empowerment. It means these women say, you know, fuck off, I'll read this in public. <laughs> that's what I'm about. And I will have a minor orgasm here on the end of the at half past six in the morning whilst I travel to work because I can do that. And I think, you know, we've got a long way to go in the rest of the world before that happens, but it's a, it's a good and, 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 and empowering and <laughs> It just occurs to me, we're talking about sex. Well, we're sitting here in the broad daylight. Where is Fifty Shades of Grey? Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah I, went to, I went to India to do, uh, to talk about books and things. 
and they had a panel, and this is you know, characteristic of, of Indian sexual culture, they had a panel on erotic fiction, and they had put four middle-aged men on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and I emailed him in advance saying, don't you think we should maybe have some women on the panel? And I, no, you know, that, because you know, that is such a sexist culture. Know about sex? Yeah, the audience was full of women who'd read Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very tricky situation. Um, I don't know, I just said, I think um, for, you know, for you two, writing about sex and non-fiction must be a, a, a pleasure. But I, I find, you know, writing about sex, sexing in fiction is just blood hard work. <laughs> Do more research. <laughs> That's my answer. But there's only yeah. set a month of research. Set a month of research yeah. you can do. But anyway, I find it that. Uh, <coughs> maybe, maybe just one final question, unless you, you, you folks have something else you want to talk about. Uh, you know, and John Lee Jai, you would know something about this. When the '80s, when suddenly you know things changed, you started getting influx. Are we are we looking? For, I mean, I'm thinking of the Jolene Ho. You know, they're they're very westernized. They watch Big Bang Theory. They watch Walking Dead and everything. You know, they know it, and they're, you know, uh, when I see my students who are American, 18, 19 year olds, with these people, they're on the same page, basically. Are we seeing a future in China where sexuality and sexual mores and things just blend seamlessly into a world multicultural sort of, or, or is there, is that unlikely? Are we gonna, is, is China always going to have this very distinctive sort of, or is it going to become just Westernized? I mean, I've, yeah, I've actually been asked this once before, and my answer is, I really, really hope not. I think it'll really be boring if we all start looking the same. But there's a caveat that, you know, that's, I hope that each culture can get rid of the negatives within it. So, you know, in the case of China, it is, you know, the sexual gains have largely been available to men over women, and I hope that the women can enjoy more of it. I hope that people can have more safe sex in the future, that society can maybe change a bit the way that how prominent kind of the family is but at the same time I, w I mean it would just be terrible if everyone started doing what we're doing back home I wouldn't have anything to write about. <laughs> so interesting we're talking about sex revolution they're essentially very much driven by women and women are more interested in experiment and also the women now um, start to you know the result now the, the divorce rate is going very high and not only because men um, started sleeping around, but also the women uh, began to demand equality of their sex life when they cannot not happy with their husband, and then they can ask for a divorce. Yeah, yes. and also, do you think that, uh, just a quick question, do you think that things have gone backwards from a sort of an ideal of at least equality and that with the new commercialized society, you actually got this new exploitation of women. Things have gone backwards in a certain sense. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I certainly yes. I think the um, uh, reform brought a lot of opportunity for to both men and women, um, but also brought uh, you know setbacks. We're talking about uh, you know the um, uh, the growing prostitution and growing phenomenon uh, phenomenon of RNA. That very much re reflect. The unbalanced the power between men and women, and basically because before um, and now, because the market economy, the governments retreated some responsibilities to the market, um, but the market does not always um, look up women, you know, treat women with kindness. Uh, for example, women, um, female students now have much harder time finding employment. And before, when men or women, both men and women were assigned jobs. Um, and the income gap between men and women also widening. That's also the reason spending some women find easier to find, marry well, or have become mistress of some. Well, if you look at the, the history of sex in the West over a very long period, and there's a very good book for that actually. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you look at that, you know, this is a question I grapple with. A lot. Um, you know, I think two things. The first is we, we love to think in terms of progress. We love to think that things are going forward and they're getting better. And that's a very seductive idea. And it predisposes us to think that where we are now is kind of inevitable and it's only going to get better. And so, so, so we should be aware of that. You know, history is full of paths that could have taken us elsewhere. And actually, if you look at the history of the West and the history of the rest of the world, the 18th century is the period in which the point which 
West now suddenly takes off on this completely new trajectory, and that's why you know the world is different sexually in the West now than it than it was ever before. From the, from, if you compare it globally, so that's the first thing. But the other thing is, I do believe in progress in a different way, which is that sexual freedom is better than sexual repression, and having individuals being allowed to do what they like with their own bodies is a good thing, and not having the state and the community and the family imposing communal values and policing those and repressing people, punishing them, is a good thing, and I think that's better. Um, so I think that everywhere where we see that advancing, and we have seen it advance in, the, in historical terms, and we are seeing it today in terms of, especially now, in terms of gay rights and, and trans rights are the, the new great cutting edge of that, that's a good thing, and we should celebrate that. So it's not just a story about you know, things going forwards and backwards. There is also real historical progress that we can talk about. Just one quick com comment about the relationship between sex revolution and prostitution. In the West, um, the prostitution actually has gone down uh, after sexual revolution started because you can have casual sex. That's the second sex or sex. <laughs> <laughs> but in China, it seems different. I mean, we have both explosion of, um, um, you know, prostitution yeah. and sexual. Well, I think that's because, as I, as I tried to say earlier, because it's the lack of sexual equality in Chinese culture still. I think as women and men become equally empowered in, in China as elsewhere, you probably will see the decline of prostitution. But you know, it's a long-term thing. China has its guo qi, right? National characteristics. Chinese characteristics. Chinese characteristics, right. All right, on that positive note, that's, that was very uplifting. I feel much better now from the historians. Sex is going to be better in the 21st century. <laughs> With that, why don't we open up? I'm sure there's a few things we didn't talk about that people might want to know about. Oh, yeah, this guy has it. Um, just to kind of follow up on that idea of progress, um, I think in the interest of talking about like sexual openness, um, the word rape, I mean, it, it didn't come up once, and I think that's probably because it's such a, a, a taboo word and a taboo idea. Um, and yet, I think kind of on the like global uh, scale, it, it's being talked about a little bit more. Um, I think, uh, you know, in, in the media, it's, it's become kind of, it's gotten a little bit more... Uh, in India, especially. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and in... Or in campuses uh, in the States. Campuses yeah. in the US. Exactly, yeah. Um, and I just think maybe, do you think we're kind of approaching any kind of cultural watershed in terms of, of rape, or, or maybe are there any kind of uh, Chinese um, views on, on this? So, yeah, I actually do very, very briefly mention rape in my book because there are huge statistics, really shocking statistics. <coughs> One was done by the UN a few years ago, which said that 22% 20, I think of men had raped their girlfriend or wives. And then another one by a Chinese organization, which said something like 50% had abused girlfriends or wives with abuse that also was also kind of physical abuse, not just sexual. What's really interesting is that we're, I think we are seeing a bit of a watershed in this respect. I think it's going to take a long time, but this is the first year where there's, um, in 2014, there's a draft of the first domestic violence law, which should be passed, they just said last week, should be passed in August. And there was the famous case of Kim Lee, who was abused by her husband, and she cited domestic abuse as one of them. And it was the first time, I think, in a Chinese law court where they had actually recognized that that's a legitimate grounds for divorce. So with these cases the more and more that come about you know the more hopeful it will be that said chinese feminist activists were also arrested last week ahead of women's day you know it, this i guess goes back to progress is not linear and i think if you'd asked me two weeks ago how i feel when they were talking about the domestic abuse thing which has ramifications for rape culture i would say i felt i feel really optimistic a week later with the arrested activist i feel less optimistic 45 feminist activists being arrested and disappeared and nobody could get in touch with them. This part yeah. of the crackdown. So even on a week by week basis you see progress going. So you know we'll have to see. But I hope I hope for their women's sake that it is something that's taken a lot more seriously. I mean in, in England in the United Kingdom uh, rape within marriage was not illegal, not made illegal until nineteen ninety one. You know, that's very, very recent. So I, I, you know just as a general point 
or two general points. One, one is the more people speak out against rape, the more it's a sign of female empowerment. And you see that in India, you see that on campuses in, in the United States, uh, you see that, I guess, I guess also in, in China. The other point, which is a harder point, a more difficult point, is that the definition of rape is historically changeable, is contingent. And partly what we're seeing is people speaking out, as I think Jemima and, and, and Mijan were also gesturing to, rape is not just a single thing. Rape is a part of a culture of sexual um, abuse and, and other kinds of abuse. So it can't, you know, there are other things that, that are part of this spectrum. Um, and in my book, I talk a lot about uh, 18th century, 17th century, 18th century, 19th century cultures of you know, maleness and femaleness. And, and, and one of the really uncomfortable things about looking at the Western past is how much what we would now see as abuse and harassment and rape is covered up by other words and other ways of thinking in the past, like seduction. If you look at 18th century Western culture, you know, the novels, the plays, the poetry, the art, the philosophy is all full of the idea of men seducing women. And that, you know, it's part of how people behave. And, and doubtless, you know, similar things are happening in cultures around the world today. You know, men pursue women and they get them to sleep with them. Well, actually, if you, if you look at that, with 21st century eyes, a lot of what's going on there, we would class as rape. So, you know, that, that's a really uncomfortable thing. It's, it's also a reminder that we're more sensitized now, you know, because of the politics of sex are changing and, and, and because of the politics of men and women are changing. Actually, just, just to quickly go one final thing on this. Um, people, I'm assuming, have VPNs. It's a very good thing um, that's gone viral about tea, and it compares having a cup of tea to to rape, basically, in terms of blurred lines, and this woman's just gone on the record saying, I'm just going to make it simple, exactly what a definition of rape is, and does this amazing analogy, it's, it's really, really quite funny, but quite pertinent, and everyone should read that, because I think that's the thing, is with the blurred lines, you know, people are still debating this, even in the UK in 2015. We have a, we have a talk for our undergraduates at Oxford, where we talk about, you know, safe cultures and harassment and rapes. <laughs> Apparently, once someone once gave this talk and said, "Look, the, the traditional definition is, um, you know, you need to have someone's consent before you have sex with them. But don't you think consent is rather a low bar? Should you really be going for it? enthusiasm?" <laughs> <laughs> sexual revolution is necessarily more adventurous if we're kind of using adventurous in a basic lots of different positions threesomes etc kind of way um, I haven't necessarily seen evidence of that um, I think it's just as interesting I think it kind of manifests in different ways that we've been discussing but yeah I'm not I'm not sure there's a I think it's it's quite difficult to make those kind of comparisons in terms of the, um, the former question, do you maybe need to go into I'm sure anti-corruption probably reduced lots of uh, <laughs> sexual activities in the bedroom. Um, anyway, just the official just moves. We know that's true, yeah. It's, it has, uh, a lot of people are scared. I mean, you give up maybe five of your earnings. Earn <laughs> so, yeah, I don't have a very direct response to this, but I was interested when my book was translated into Chinese, it has lots of great pictures, as David said, and they're also available in the Kindle edition. Right? So, but not in color. I have a regular color. Sorry. Um, but the, you know, the Chinese publishers refused to print several of the pictures, and, uh, and I pushed back against this, and they went all the way to the government bureau, and, and they still have not printed all the pictures. And these, to my mind, are quite terrible. Well, they're, they're not, they're actually very titillating. Um, but, <laughs> but there are eight, there are eighteenth century black and white engravings. You know, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not uh, you know, or, or like the yes, 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 yes. So I, I'm interested yeah. in you know this can't be publicly uh, published in China by a reputable press still. That that's interesting. 
And one anecdote. You know, recently China had this uh, hugely popular historical drama about Wu Zetian, Empress Wu. And originally she uh, played by beautiful Han Bingbing, full chested. And uh, in the it was Tang Dynasty, in the Tang Dynasty, women did wear quite low cut dresses. And uh, they were, uh, at that time, being you know, fat, being regarded as beautiful. But anyway, there were lots of shots of Fan Bingbing showing her cleavage. And then it was, it already passed the censorship, but then now it's being called back and, and, and all the cleavage has been cut. And as to fill the screen, they have to blow up her head. So, <laughs> um, anyway, so this is a, anyway, indirectly the result of anti corruption. And uh, um, not necessarily Xi Jinping himself uh, directed that to, to cut, the, cut the breasts. But uh, some people just uh, they felt this is, you know, everything's tightening. So this, that's why they, this um, thing, unfortunately, went in cutting the cleavage happened. So, anyway. Maybe, uh, maybe just one more question. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you. I'm happy to be here and listen to you guys and really refresh my mind. And I'm a local Chinese, first of all. And uh, uh, actually, I heard about the world wars about R9 prostitute. I think that's really normal in China. I know we know that. But actually, one more thing. Actually, women, they're seeking for other men too, within or without marriage. For my wife, and uh, I'm 18. And so women keep a... They will keep their marriage and they still have other lovers. For many reasons. Maybe because they're powerful, like some of them like kind of deserting have powers. <coughs> because I think um, China might be one of the country women have really a lot of rights. I, I think uh, the, the women in our society actually have higher, you know, um, how to say, uh, statutory or position compared to a lot of countries in the world. That's true. And maybe um, it's not that obvious, but it's true. And uh, most of the Chinese people, women, they're working. And maybe they cannot be the cheap one, but actually they're taking really uh, important position in many companies, in many positions, even in the government. And, um, and some of them, they're having lovers just for fun, like romance. They're having them maybe you know, what, what, I don't know how to call it, aren't I, for men, you know? And many of them, uh, they're having that just because they're not such with their, their, their husband. Maybe they're not, they're not rich, the women, they're not rich, and they don't have a happy about their marriage. They will find lovers uh, from work or from anyone else. And uh, I think sometimes, most of the time, I think it's just not about money or you get what you want through sex, you know. Uh, and I don't agree that R9 uh, or Xiaoxian or whatever, that's just for money. I think sometimes... By the way, the women not only have lovers, some women do use prostitutes. And, you know, yeah. in China, the female prostitute, the slang word for that is the G chicken. Yeah. And uh, the male prostitutes, the ducks. The ducks are far more expensive. Yeah. Far more expensive. <laughs> they say they have more work to do, actually. What my point is, actually, everybody is trying to seek for fun from sex and from the, uh, you know, the same gender or the other gender. They're seeking for love or sexual orgasm, whatever. And my point is, um, marriage is not a thing uh, which can um, fully satisfy you. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I don't think uh, having sex or being in love with another person will be necessarily helpful for the relationship you're having. Actually, I think okay, maybe. Let, let, let's let them respond. <laughs> uh, yeah, I want to know. I, I want to know. Jemima should interview you. Why don't you? Interview <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, I'm sorry. You, you Thank you. Go an ahead. Excellent, an excellent <laughs> candidate for my book. <laughs> book two. Uh, so can you, can you quickly ask your question? Oh yes. yeah. My point is, um, I think um, um, sex itself could be fun no matter in the marriage or not. So sometimes I think the sex outside the marriage could help the marriage itself too. What do you think about that? Uh, 
I, I can give private personal relationship advice later. So anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I don't. I, well, you know, it's it's, it's a it's a it's a point of view, and people throughout uh, history and in the present have taken that view, and other people not. It depends on you know again what what people seek from marriage. If you think marriage in the West now, the ideal of marriage is two soulmates who find each other and find everything in their relationship. Now, there's all sorts of ways in which that obviously creates very, very high expectations that then do not always get fulfilled, and high divorce rates are one sign of that. But I think that the more interesting point, actually, for me, about all the things that you said, was a very interesting, important point that you started off with, about how Chinese women comparatively do have quite a lot of status and, and power. And I think that is interesting. If you look at the world today, that's certainly true. Um, I'm thinking in India, that's not true, and, and especially it's not true across the Islamic world, where you know the, the sex differences are much more marked, um, not just sexually, but in terms of power and the ability to go out to work and so on. And I suppose you know this is one way in which communism has made a huge difference in China. It's, you know the, the ideal of sexual equality, whatever it means in practice, is so strongly part of socialism and of communism that it made a tremendous difference to women. In, in, in all communist states. And I just say, go back to the 18th century, because you know, that's the point at which the first radical socialists started to articulate uh, ideas about uh, equality of all kinds. So the first uh, women who, you know, the, the, the first uh, people who advocate sexual freedom both for men and for women are radicals and socialists around 1800. Uh, and you know they believe in free love for both sexes. It's a wonderful passage in my book about that. So um, yeah, I absolutely take your point, and I don't know what anyone wants from their own marriage, and I can't help you with that. So. All right, uh, I think that's all the time we have, right? Okay, so let's give a big hand to our panelists. I think they're really great. That's for Johnny to have with Lotus coming up next year, maybe? No, February 2017. Wow, oh, too much. That's, 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 that's gratification. I want instant gratification. gratification. <laughs> and Jemima's book? In the back. In the back, okay. So uh, buy their books. And thank you for coming. And hers when it comes out. And, and thank you all for coming. And go home and have safe sex. <laughs> Uh, if I may add a last point, uh, several of our speakers today are also giving other talks during the festival. Li Jiazhang is sadly finished, this is her last event, but uh, Jemima is giving a book talk on her book, Little Emperors and Material Girls, on the 23rd, Monday, at 1pm. Uh, Farmers is doing two talks. He's on another panel about research, inquiry, and the right of work on Tuesday the 17th, and on, at 1pm, and on the same day about his book at 6pm. David Moser, our moderator, is moderating another one, I believe, which is Changing China on Sunday, 22nd at 4 more about modern Chinese changes. Thanks all very much for coming.